Okay, welcome everyone. This is the sixth of our ARG UK Autumn Seminar Series. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about amphibian diseases and we're going to be focusing on BSAL, which is a relatively new disease to continental Europe, but in the short time it's been with us, it's caused a certain amount of chaos. So I'm hopefully, there we go, introduce our panel. Um, I'm going to introduce Alice Paulick, actually. She's our ARG UK trustee and she's a PhD student at the University of Exeter. And she's doing her PhD on establishing the links between skin microbiome pollution and disease susceptibility in a native UK amphibian species. And that will be the common frog. So over to you, Alice. Alice is going to be our Master of Ceremonies for tonight and introduce our panellists and keep us all in order. So off you go, Alice. Thank you, Angie, and thanks for having me today. And so hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us this evening at the ARG UK Autumn Seminar Series. Today we'll be hearing from three speakers about understanding and managing the spread of a highly aggressive amphibian disease. We're going to be focusing on the novel form of chytrid, which is Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans, also known as BSAL. Uh, so we'll be hearing three talks, two that are scientific research talks and one based on research and disease management. And firstly, we're going to be hearing from Joe Heaver, who's from Garden Wildlife Health and the Institute of Zoology. Who will introduce the UK's amphibian diseases and then discuss garden wildlife health's research into them. Then we're going to go straight to Anne-Marie Spitzen from Ravon, who will discuss B-cell in mainland Europe and how to detect it, how to report it and prevent its spread. And then finally we'll be hearing from Stefano Canessa from Wildlife Health Ghent, who will discuss how to manage B-cell outbreaks. So after all of the talks we're going to have a Q&A session well, I'm going to put your submitted questions to our panellists. So please, throughout the talks, if you can put your questions in the Q&A chat box, which should be at the bottom of the screens, so not the general chat, there's a nice Q&A one. And if you do that throughout the talks, I'll read them out at the end. And we'll be finishing off this evening at 9pm. So I'm very excited. I'm going to first hand over to Joe Heber. Off to you. Thanks, Alice. Um, right, I'm going to try and share my screen now. There, stand by. <laughs> okay. Okay, can we see that? Good stuff, brilliant. Right, so thanks very much for that, Alice. Um, yes, my name is Joe, and I work on the Garden Wildlife Health Project at ZSL. And this evening, I'm going to be talking about um, basically the diseases which are faced by amphibians here in the UK, uh, and also what you can do to help. So I thought I should start off just by explaining what the Garden Wildlife Health Project actually is. So we're a collaborative citizen science project between ZSL, the BTO, the RSPB and Froglife. Uh, and our aim is to monitor the health of British wildlife and identify any disease threats to it. The tax which we cover are hedgehogs, garden birds, birds of prey, reptiles and of course amphibians. So in a nutshell, this is how the project works. Uh, so we receive reports of sick or dead wildlife from the great British public. Uh, and in some cases, we'll request submission of carcasses in order to conduct a post-mortem exam. Uh, every sample submitted to us uh, is then examined, diagnosed and archived in one of the largest wildlife tissue banks in the world. The data from these reports uh, and post-mortem exams then goes into a national database, and that can be combined with data from abundance surveys. So, for example, from the BTO's Garden Birdwatch scheme um, to work out if a disease could be having an impact on a population. All this information then goes towards providing evidence-based advice uh, to the public, to NGOs and to government agencies. So I gave quite a similar talk to this at the HERP workers meeting up in Southport earlier this year. Um, so apologies for any repetition of what I talked about then, but I'm gonna try and focus more this evening on what are widely considered to be the most important amphibian pathogens in Europe. So the ranaviruses and the chytrid fungi. Uh, I'm gonna try and give you an up-to-date picture of what's going on with these in the UK. Uh, and then gonna talk about some of the practical things you can do uh, to try and minimize the impact these diseases have on British amphibians. Okay, so first off, I'm going to talk about ranaviruses. So ranaviruses are this big group of DNA viruses, and there are three main strains or lineages um, which are known to affect amphibians. Frog virus 3, uh, which is probably the most widespread ranavirus globally, 
Uh, common midwife toad virus, which has been associated with amphibian mass mortality events in mainland Europe, and Ambistoma tigridum virus, uh, which has been linked with mass tiger salamander mortality uh, in North America. So these viruses can infect and cause disease in amphibians, reptiles and fish and can actually be transmitted between those classes. Not all amphibians infected with ranavirus uh, will develop disease, uh, but those that do usually show signs of either a systemic hemorrhagic disease or an ulcerative skin disease, or sometimes a combo of the two. So here are some nice gory post-mortem images of some frogs with ranoviral disease. Uh, so you can see this common frog on the left is showing signs of the hemorrhagic disease. So you can see the arrow marked A uh, shows some bleeding in the intestines and arrow marked B shows some hemorrhages in the oviducts. Uh, so the frog on the right has these typical uh, ulcerative skin lesions you can see here down the middle um, and they can pop up pretty much anywhere on the body uh, and when they affect the feet they can actually lead to a loss of digits. So current evidence suggests that FB3 like ranoviruses arrived in the UK sometime around the 1980s, probably coming from uh, North America via the pet trade. They were then spread all around the country uh, by people transporting infectious materials, things like frog spawn and aquatic plants. And then the first reported case of ranovirus in wild British amphibians came from the southeast of England uh, around the early 90s. For a long time, we then thought that we only had FB3 like ranoviruses in the UK. Uh, but then a study a few years ago looked, at, looked back at samples collected over the last 25 years uh, and found that most cases were FB3 like. Uh, but when two samples were genetically sequenced, they were actually much closer to that common midwife toad virus, that strain which had been linked with amphibian mass mortality events in mainland Europe. So there's evidence for at least two uh, ranoviruses infecting British amphibians. All British amphibians are considered uh, susceptible to ranovirus infection, but the vast majority of cases we see are in common frogs. Unlike in other parts of the world, uh, where mortality is mostly reported in tadpoles and larvae, we see it mainly in adults. Uh, in the UK, it's really seasonal. The vast majority of outbreaks we see are in the summer. Uh, and finally, we see that ulcerative skin disease, um, as well as the systemic hemorrhagic disease, which is much more commonly reported from other parts of the world. So another study uh, made use of archived samples from the Frog Mortality Project, as well as data from frog life, uh, to compare common frog population dynamics between ranovirus positive and ranovirus negative ponds. So what they found was that common frog populations breeding in ranovirus positive ponds declined by an average of 83% over the 12 year study period, compared to no change at all uh, in population size in rana free ponds. So that suggests that ranovirus can cause uh, localized long-term population declines uh, in British common frogs, which makes this a disease of potential conservation concern. A study published last year actually predicted that climate change could make things worse over the next 50 years, uh, with these outbreaks occurring over more parts of the country uh, and basically extending that ranovirus season beyond summer into spring and autumn as things get warmer. OK, so moving on from ranoviruses uh, to the chytrid fungi. So there are lots of species of chytrid fungi around, uh, but as batch ecologists, there are two which we're particularly interested in. So Batrachochytrium dendropatidus, or BD, uh, was first reported in the late 90s. It can cause disease in anurans, uridils, and sicilians, and it grows best between 17 and 25 degrees C. Batrachochytrium salamandrivorans, or B-sal, uh, was first reported only in 2013. And as far as we know, it only causes disease in uridils, so that's newts and salamanders. B-sal likes things a little bit cooler. It grows best between uh, 10 and 15 degrees C. So like I said, BD has this really broad amphibian host range. It can infect anurans, uridils, and sicilians. Typically, animals are just found dead, uh, but clinical signs can include things like thickening and reddening of the skin, or signs of generalized ill health, so things like uh, lethargy and not eating. BD is widely acknowledged uh, as the most significant infectious disease threat, not just to amphibians, but to biodiversity globally, uh, having been associated with a decline of around 500 species and the presumed extinction of at least 90. It's been reported from every continent where amphibians exist, uh, with those population declines and extinctions mostly coming from uh, the tropics of Australasia and South and Central America. Current evidence suggests that the fungus probably originated in Southeast Asia uh, and emerged as a result of uh, the global amphibian trade. So BD is this huge threat to amphibian populations globally, uh, but what about here in the UK? So BD has been here since at least 2004, and back in 2008 and 2011, nationwide surveys were conducted to try and get some kind of idea of the distribution and host range of BD in the UK. 
This was actually only made possible by ARG UK volunteers, and it led to around 9,000 amphibians being swabbed over the two years of sampling. So you can see the results um, of those surveys here on these two maps, uh, with the red dots and triangles indicating positive results. So these big swabs provided some really useful information. So the distribution of BD in the UK seemed to be widespread, but really patchy. So unlike the epidemic wave-like spread reported from South and Central America, for example, this was more suggestive of either endemic infection or multiple point introductions. Around one site in six was positive for BD, and at those sites, prevalence was still fairly low, around 10 to 12 percent. All six species of native amphibian swabbed uh, tested positive for BD at least once. And interestingly, around three quarters of the BD positive sites um, were home to either natterjack toads or alien species. Now, natterjacks have obviously been the focus of a lot of translocation projects around the country in their recent history. So this suggested that potentially human activities could, pay, could play an important part um, in the spread of BD around the UK. Comparing the two sampling years, there was nothing to suggest we were in the middle of a chytrid epidemic or that BD was causing mass mortality at any sites. Bear in mind though that these surveys weren't really uh, designed to detect mortality, so that isn't to say uh, British amphibians aren't experiencing significant mortality due to BD, but based on existing evidence it doesn't look like they're experiencing the same kind of uh, mass mortalities and population declines as in other parts of the world. Saying that though, introducing uh, new novel strains of BD could change all that. OK, so we'll be hearing a lot more about B cell in Europe uh, later from Anna Marika, but I'll just give a very brief overview. Uh, so from around 2010, a closely monitored population of fire salamanders on the Dutch Belgian border um, was found to be in sharp decline with a surge in reports um, of dead salamanders around the same area at the same time. Some of these animals were examined post-mortem and they were tested for BD, ranavirus and a few other pathogens to try and work out what could be killing these salamanders. All tests came back negative and it transpired that these mortalities were the result of a hitherto unidentified chytrid fungus, which was then named Betrachochytrium salamandrivorans, or B-sal for short. Since 2010, uh, that fire salamander population in the Netherlands has declined by 99.9% .9 due to B-sal. And the fungus has also been reported in Germany, Spain and Belgium, where it's driven further declines. Current evidence suggests that B-sal only causes disease in uridils, although some frogs and toads seem to be able to carry it without getting sick. Like BD, it also looks like BD originated in Asia uh, and likely came to Europe via the pet trade. Also like BD, uh, the clinical signs of B-cell chytridiomycosis are quite varied. Uh, ulcerative or erosive skin lesions like these here tend to pop up quite late in the disease. Uh, and other clinical signs can include things like abnormal wobbly gait, not eating, impaired skin shedding, that kind of thing. Uh, but again, affected animals more often than not just found dead. So what about here in the UK? The good news is that there's no evidence to suggest that B-cell is currently circulating in wild British amphibians. A ZSL study published last year looked back at swabs taken from newts during that big chytrid nationwide swabbing effort in 2011, uh, and all samples tested negative for B-cell. Since 2013, all uridil samples submitted to us at Garden Wildlife Health have also tested negative. However, B-cell is here in the UK, just only in captive collections. B cell was first reported in a captive amphibian in the UK in 2015. Uh, another ZSL study then looked at the levels of B cell in captive collections in Europe. And it turned out that it's pretty widespread. So four out of the five UK collections tested contained at least one B cell positive animal. And in one of those collections, 91% of uridils were infected. So if B cell does make its way into wild amphibian populations in Great Britain, uh, current evidence suggests it could have a significant impact on our native newts. So as part of a study back in 2014, 35 species of amphibian, mostly uridils, uh, were exposed to B cell under controlled conditions to try and work out which species were susceptible to infection and mortality uh, and which weren't. And obviously over the last seven years since uh, B cell was first reported, there have also been a lot of reports uh, of infected uh, wild amphibians from mainland Europe. So we're starting to get some kind of idea um, of which species we need to be particularly worried about. So as you can see in this table, it looks like all three of our native newts as well as alpine newts are susceptible to infection with B cell and at least two of those can die from it. So B cell reaching free ranging uh, newt populations in the UK could lead to mass mortality and even population declines um, like in mainland Europe. So it is vitally important that we do everything we can to prevent B-cell from jumping from captive to wild amphibians in the UK. 
The only way of preventing this from happening is by following some simple biosecurity measures. And there's a list of these measures um, in our updated uh, B cell delete, uh, amphibian disease alert, rather, which you can find on the Garden Wildlife Health website. Obviously, we can't know for sure that B cell hasn't already entered wild populations. So it's also vitally important uh, that field herpetologists and other frog botherers like me, and no doubt many of you watching, uh, follow strict biosecurity measures uh, to avoid spreading B cell or any other pathogens uh, between different sites. Uh, the Amphibian Disease Precautions Guide for UK Field Workers, catchy title, uh, was produced by ARG UK, ARC Trust and ZSL a few years ago. Uh, and that lays out some really good, uh, simple, gu uh, simple and practical guidelines. Uh, and you can find that on the ARG UK website. So as well as these biosecurity measures, we can also keep up our wildlife disease surveillance so that if B cell does spill over into the wild, we can detect it quickly and put into action a plan to control its spread. So disease surveillance is our job at Garden Wildlife Health, uh, but we completely rely on reports and submissions from you guys, the general public, uh, to be able to do our job effectively. We've also teamed up with the ecology consultancy uh, to try and improve our B-cell surveillance by essentially asking their field ecologists uh, to swab newts when they're out on surveys so we can then screen them for B-cell. The idea behind this is that it expands our disease surveillance beyond areas often visited by the public and basically improves our chances of detecting B-cell outbreaks quickly if and when they do happen. If there happen to be any other ecological consultants out there who would potentially be interested in getting involved, then please do get in touch. Uh, you know, the more eyes and ears we can have out in the field, uh, the better in terms of detecting B-cell outbreaks quickly if and when they happen. So this is the Amphibian Disease Precautions Guide for Field Workers, which you can find on the ARG website. As I said, anybody who's visiting amphibian habitats, either to conduct surveys as part of an ARG group or whatever, please do have a read through this uh, and stick to those guidelines as closely as you can. And this is our recently updated amphibian disease alert. So we put this together in collaboration with a load of other uh, wildlife -y, amphibian -y type organisations. And this is really aimed at anybody who keeps amphibians, has a wildlife pond, or has pretty much anything else at all to do with amphibians. Uh, it gives some more information on the diseases I've talked about this evening, and then it outlines some really simple things you can do uh, to help protect uh, native amphibians from these diseases. So the main focus here is B cell, because as far as we know, it hasn't yet reached wild populations, um, but it's not just B cell that we're worried about here. So just because we already have some strains of BD and ranaviruses here in the UK, that doesn't mean that further introductions couldn't make things a whole lot worse. There are lots of other strains of BD and ranaviruses around the world, uh, and they can be much more aggressive and even form hybrids with each other or with the strains we already have um, to form really nasty virulent strains, which could be potentially bad news for British amphibians. So now I'm just going to go through a few of those key things uh, that you can do to reduce the risk of inadvertently introducing B cell or any other amphibian pathogens into wild populations. OK, so first up, please never release amphibians from captivity into the wild. As I mentioned earlier, B cell seems to be around in captive collections here in the UK and a healthy looking amphibian can still be carrying B cell without showing any signs of illness. And to give you an idea of how damaging this can be, back in 2018, uh, there was a B cell outbreak in Catalonia in northern Spain. And all evidence points to this having been the result of a private collector releasing captive newts into a local pond. We'll be hearing a lot more about this outbreak later from Stefano. Um, but basically a huge amount of effort and expense went into trying to contain this one outbreak. Um, and as of summer 2019, I don't know if Stefanos will have an update that's more recent for us, but as of summer 2019, it was still only considered temporarily contained and not eradicated. It really is incredibly difficult uh, to eradic eradicate a wildlife disease outbreak once it's already happened. OK, next, there is no reason to move amphibians from one site to another. If you dig a new pond, amphibians will find it and they'll colonise it surprisingly quickly. Um, so there's no need to start bringing spawn or adult amphibians to a new pond. It's a really good way of accelerating the spread of diseases around the country. As I mentioned earlier, we think this was an important part of how uh, ranavirus has got around Great Britain over the last 30 years, and it would likely be a similar story with b -cell. OK, so this is something which not nearly enough amphibian keepers do. Um, get your amphibians tested. In fairness, it's not obvious how to do this, even if you want to, um, but hopefully this can clear things up a little bit. So infection with chytrid fungi can be diagnosed from a single skin swab, um, which you can do yourself. You just need to go to the B Cell Europe website where there's a list of labs, contact the lab to do the testing, take some swabs, send them in the post, and you can get a result within a few weeks. 
And this isn't just about protecting wild amphibians. It's also important to know uh, for the health of your own collection. Plus, BD and B cell can actually be treated and cured relatively easily uh, with either heat treatment or antifungal drugs. If you'd like BD or B cell testing done here in the UK, we're the people to contact. Uh, just drop us an email and we can give you more details on how it all works. Uh, and if enough hobbyists do this, we really could significantly reduce this uh, reservoir of infection in captive collections, uh, which could then massively reduce uh, the risk, the, the chances basically of B cell being uh, released into, into the wild. Okay, so as of 2018, any international movement of newts or salamanders into or within the EU had to include a six week quarantine period, which includes testing and or treatment. Now, I can't imagine that that many of you are currently moving amphibians internationally, um, but if you are, you can find out more details on that um, by going to that link there, which is also in the disease alert. Um, for movements of amphibians which don't cross international borders, any new arrival should be quarantined for at least six weeks, and if at all possible, tested with a skin swab before you add them in with the rest of your collection. And while that new arrival is in quarantine, just bear in mind that chytrid fungi are pretty hardy little things, um, so make sure you're using different equipment and manage them completely separately to the rest of your collection. OK, so this isn't something which seems to go on too much in the UK, basically because our climate's so awful, but I know some people like to keep these guys, European tree frogs, in outdoor enclosures, so I think it's probably worth mentioning. Um, for obvious reasons, keeping potentially infected captive amphibians outside where they could come into contact with wild amphibians is just a really bad idea. It works both ways, so not only are you are endangering native amphibians, but also potentially exposing your own collection um, to infected wild amphibians. Let's not forget that BD and ranoviruses are pretty widespread in the UK, uh, and they can be really nasty in captive collections. For the same reason, not a good idea to clean amphibian tanks outside. OK, so this one's so important, it has its own set of guidelines, and you can find those on the Garden Wildlife Health website, uh, and there's a link to them in the disease alert, diesel, disease alert as well. Uh, they're not exactly a page turner, but this is really important stuff to know if you keep uh, captive amphibians. As I've said already, apparently healthy amphibians can still be infected with B cell, BD or ranoviruses and could be happily shedding uh, these pathogens into their enclosure without you knowing. If you then do a water change and decide to water the flower beds with the wastewater, you're potentially pouring huge numbers of these pathogens straight into the environment where they can easily come into contact with wild amphibians. The same applies to tipping used substrates or, or on the compost heap or, or anything like that. It's not complicated stuff. It's all laid out in more detail in the guidelines. Um, but the gist is for water, you just want to siphon it into a bucket, add some disinfectant, F10 and Vercon work really well, and you can pick them up pretty cheaply online, leave the disinfectant to work for a few minutes, and then flush it down the toilet. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, use substrates and amphibian carcasses, uh, yet also need to be disposed of carefully. Uh, and again, more details on that in the guidelines. OK, so this last one is really important, and it applies uh, to everybody listening, not just amphibian keepers. So at Garden Wildlife Health, it's our job to conduct wild amphibian disease surveillance, but we can only do that um, with the help of the public, particularly those of you with an interest in amphibians or wildlife generally, who are more likely to stumble across uh, sick or dead wildlife when you're out and about or even in your own gardens. So please do report sick or dead amphibians to us. It's super easy to do. It literally takes about five minutes. Um, just go to the website, click the report button and fill in a few details. That will then come straight through to us. Um, and we can get back to you usually within 24 hours with information on what could be going on and to arrange submission of the carcass uh, for a post-mortem exam if that's an option. So to summarise, ranoviruses can and does cause localised long-term population declines in common frogs. BD is here, but it isn't clear exactly what impact it's having on British amphibians. It doesn't seem to be having a massive impact as in other parts of the world, uh, but like I said earlier, new strains being introduced could change that. B cell does not appear to be here yet, or at least not outside captive collections, uh, and it's vitally important we keep it that way. Biosecurity is the key to protecting the health of British amphibians, not just in terms of B cell, but lax biosecurity could also mean releasing different, potentially nasty strains um, of BD and ranovirus into wild populations. And that's not to mention um, the diseases we haven't discovered yet. So 10 years ago, nobody knew B cell existed. Uh, and this time last year, we hadn't heard of COVID-19. So it's not necessarily just the diseases we're aware of, um, which we need to be careful about. Please do have a look at that amphibian disease alert if you have anything at all to do with amphibians. Um, and finally, so much of the information in this talk is only available as a direct result of citizen science projects. These projects, including Garden Wildlife Health, completely rely on the general public. So please do report any sick or dead wild amphibians to us via our website. That's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. 
Thank you, Joe. That was an incredibly informative talk. It was awesome. I really like the term frog botherers. I think a lot of us can, uh, can associate with that one. Um, just a quick reminder before we move on to the next talk, any questions that you have, can you please put them into the Q&A box and not the chat box? Um, so I can answer, uh, I can give them to the panelists to answer at the end. And also the talk is being recorded and will be available online soon. So any links or anything that you're not managing to grab as we zoom past, you can get later on. Okay, uh, coming up next, we have Anne-Marika Spitzman. Uh, yeah, I am unmuted. So everybody's seeing my first slide? Hopefully, yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you kindly for inviting me today to speak at your autumn webinar series. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anne-Marie Spitze and I work for Ravon, Reptile Amphibian Fish Conservation, the Netherlands. Uh, initially, when I, when I started working there, I really wanted to work with slow worms because I think they're just the, the coolest animals uh, alive. But then as things go, I started to work more and more on amphibians. And uh, when I was doing my PhD on the impact of um, alien invasive pathogens on uh, amphibian populations, uh, B-cell was discovered. So now this is my main focus uh, uh, at work. So. I know there are many good things in the Netherlands um, that are not so abundant in the UK, such as good coffee and hageslag, uh, stroopwafels and bicycle lanes, but there are also some things in the Netherlands that you should not uh, copy, such as the presence of B-cell in your native amphibian populations. So therefore, the aim of my talk today is to stress the importance of an early warning system and of disinfecting your field materials. Um, so my apologies for the overlap with Joe's talk, um, uh, but I think I'll be complimentary to his uh, as well. And so I visualized my take home messages in this picture. So if these are the only things that you remember from my presentation, I'll be, I'll be happy. So observe, report and clean your field materials. Uh, Joe addressed it already a bit, uh, but I wanted just briefly to take you back to, the, uh, to tell you a bit history about the discovery of B cell in the Netherlands, just to show you how important it is just to report everything that you see, that you think is remarkable, that's not normal uh, to the people working on it and who, can, who are able to analyze things. So, so this is the Netherlands, so this is you. Uh, and this is the southern part of the Netherlands where we have, or where we used to have, three viable populations of fire salamanders. So this is the largest one, the Bundabos area. Um, this population is extinct now. This was an introduced small population. And this used to be a slightly larger population, but still with lower numbers than, than the, the main population here. Um, and all these three populations were monitored since 1997 by, by these really, really dedicated volunteers. And then from 2010 onwards, they started reporting um, they called me and they said, okay, we're seeing um, less and less alive fire salamanders and occasionally we even see dead ones, which was something that they had never uh, encountered before. So that was quite remarkable. Uh, but then of course, it's always, if you see in your garden pond that there are less toads. So are there really less toads or is it just a coincidence or didn't you really uh, remember uh, well enough how many toads there actually were last year. So that's always a bit of a difficult thing. So luckily we were able to calculate the trend, which is this dark line that you see over here. So at the beginning of the monitoring in 1997, it was set at 100. And you see that indeed that what those volunteers were seeing in the field was actually true. So there was this massive decline, and Joe said it already, of 99.9%. .9%. And so it says 2017 here, uh, but it could easily be 2020 because um, the animals there are really, um, they're quite robust because there's still fire salamanders around, even though we detect we sell annually in their, uh, in their habitat and in, their, uh, in the animals. Um, but still there's 1.0.1% uh, of the animals remaining and there's even reproduction going on every year. So they just, they keep hanging around, uh, but there's no increase. So there's absolutely no indication that they become more resistant uh, to the pathogen. So the pathogen stays there and just keeps suppressing the population. So initially when they 
uh, encountered all these dead animals, we sort of panicked and we collected some of those animals and kept them in quarantine in a zoo. Uh, but half of them died, which was a blessing in disguise because now the people from Ghent University had fresh material that they could analyze. Uh, and this allowed them to discover uh, B cell. So B cell, salamandrivorans, means literally salamander devouring. And that's also what it does. Uh, so it literally eats away the skin of the animal. Uh, which you can see here. So Joe had a picture as well, where you can nicely see the holes in the animal. But then um, you should be warned because not all infected animals look like this. And especially when you have a really dark animal, like an alpine newt, it's very difficult to see because they are already a bit spotty. So seeing those holes in a, in a small animal is really difficult. And this is also the latest stage of infection. So, so this is only the last few days and then they die. But in the beginning, there's hardly anything to see on the outside of the animals. So indeed, it is presumed that the pathogen was transferred from East Asia with the pet trade uh, by infected uh, urodeals and anurans as well. There's, uh, there has been a European project on B cell from the B cell Europe website, um, and we have been able to make some really make some really cool animations on the discovery of B cell and how to keep your collection uh, disease free. So if you have time this weekend, uh, please go to the YouTube channel of Ravon and you can find these nice animations. They don't last long, they last less than a minute, so it won't take too much time. Um, so currently we have two locations in the Netherlands where we detect B cell every year. So there are more sites in the Netherlands with B cell in wild populations but we are not able to follow up on these populations every year. So it's only from this uh, northern population here that was discovered in 2018. And there are two locations here uh, in the south of the Netherlands. So one is the, uh, the discovery that I just uh, talked about, and there's another one that I'll discuss later. Uh, but first I want to talk about this new population, which was discovered in 2018 by a volunteer who was monitoring um, Pelobatus, uh, so the common spade foot toad over there, which is a really rare species in our country. And he saw two dead crested mutes and he knew, okay, I'll bring them to Anamarika because I know she'll be really happy when she, uh, when I can bring her two dead mutes. And uh, um, they, both, they both tested positive. And um, from then on, we tested, uh, we have been able to, luckily the, the owners of the pond, because this is a really, really nice garden pond, they, they had this on card to allow us access. And so we can follow up this population uh, multiple times a year. And every time we detect uh, B cell, not only in the crested newts, but also in the smooth newts. And um, the interesting thing is, because this is what the landscape looks like. So this is the pond where we discovered B cell for the first time. And there are really, um, it's a really nice area and there are many garden ponds in the, um, in the vicinity, but then the only other pond where B cell is detected annually as well is here. Um, so this is also, um, I think, a really good take home message to, to not ignore disinfection and your hygienic protocols, your routine, uh, even when ponds are really close to each other because uh, these animals could easily migrate to other ponds. So infected smooth newts, they could easily migrate to infect, to, to infect other ponds in the vicinity, but apparently that doesn't happen. So it should be really, you should be really careful not to transport any pathogens yourself. Um, so like in the UK, we also have some captive populations with uh, B cell. Luckily uh, they have reported them cells that they had some casualties and we have been able to test them and uh, hopefully they have eliminated all the B cell in their collection. But with having B cell in uh, captive and well populations, there's always the risk of pathogen spillover and pathogen spillback. So in uh, wild animals infect the domestic ones and vice versa. And um, that these things are actually happening is what we unfortunately um, uh, uh, went through in uh, in a zoo because uh, in the beginning I told you that we had um, 
that we took some five salamanders from the outbreak site into captivity and they were held in this zoo. And a couple of years ago, we decided to build some very robust outdoor enclosures. And they, they really, I've never think that anything uh, could go through this, these enclosures. They were really, really well built. But uh, somehow uh, B cell infected alpine newts entered these enclosures and killed off nearly all of our uh, fire cell elements that were living in these outdoor enclosures. And we thought, okay, we're gonna give them a more natural facility to live in, which will do them good. Um, and then the most interesting thing is not only that um, there is, um, so here we had a wild host infecting our domestic ones, um, but that we didn't know that B cell was in the vicinity. So if it hasn't, hadn't been for those five salamanders being outside, we would never have known that there was B cell in this area of the zoo. So this only shows how really difficult it is to detect B cell and how important it is to just report all the dead nudes that you, that you find. Um, so indeed, um, B cell was detected here in, um, in the UK uh, and Joe uh, uh, told this already, but I just want, I, I really, I still wanted to show you this picture because um, the, the scientists, they, they did some contact tracing on if they could link this B cell outbreak in this collection A, where it was firstly discovered to other collections. And this picture really shows um, how easily a pathogen can spread over over Europe because um, they could trace this collection A to 16 others and they have been able to sample amphibians in 11 of them and in seven of these collections they traced uh, they found B cell so four in the UK two in the Netherlands and one even in Spain so it goes it's really important to have this um, hygienic routine uh, maintained so there is this European project uh, on B-cell uh, and the website is B-cell Europe and there's all sorts of uh, interesting information published here. Also, there's a, a really condensed list of the, of the scientific uh, manuscripts that are being published on this topic. So if you're keen and you want to read into it, this is, um, I think, the best website for now to, to, to visit. Um, so there's not only B cell in the UK and in uh, the Netherlands, but there's also B cell in Germany. And after it was described in 2013, the Germans immediately started uh, their surveillance for B cell and they discovered it. So the Netherlands is just here. Uh, oh, it's just here. And these are their, um, yeah, their B cell clusters. So this is where B cell um, just large spots with B cell that uh, they can um, survey, that they, uh, um, they monitor it every year and they find B cell continuously. But the really um, interesting um, thing about this picture is that you can see the enormous um, jumps B cell makes. So it's not indeed, it's not this epidemic wave uh, that you see that it's just gradually spreading, but you see that it all of a sudden it pops up uh, 200 kilometers further away. And that um, can only be done by, uh, by humans, uh, I think, because there's no salamanders that, that walk that far. Uh, and this is an intriguing one because here, uh, this is a novel outbreak which was just recently described and it's now nearly on, or it's on the Austrian border where it could threaten the Salamandra Lanzai. So this is a really uh, scary point. Um, and we always think that Bissau was discovered in 2013 for the first time, but um, apparently there had been an outbreak of B cell in 2004 already, because there has, was a mass mortality event of fire salamanders just here, uh, close to the uh, Belgian border, and the Netherlands is here, so this is Aker. Uh, and so the person who found these dead fire salamanders collected them and stored them, and these animals were analyzed recently, uh, and apparently there had been a B cell mass mortality event in 2004 here already. 
Um, when the B cell was discovered, the scientists, they immediately tested which species were susceptible and which weren't. And in their lab analysis, they found that uh, uh, toads and frogs, that the fungus didn't attach to the skin of the frogs and the toads. But um, in Germany, they found a common frog with B cell. So we don't know exactly what it means yet, um, but it just shows that things in the lab are not always uh, the things as they go in wild, wild or in field situations. Um, so in the outbreak site that we had with crested newt that we're just talking about, we haven't seen any mass declines yet or any severe declines of crested newts in a population that could be because it is quite an open population. So animals could just enter, um, enter this pond. So a decline would not be so obvious to see. Because um, in Germany, they report some serious declines on, of crested newt populations uh, due to B cell. So in Belgium, there's B cell as well. It was relatively quickly discovered after uh, the Dutch cases uh, were, were found. Uh, they have a national action plan, but there's no consistent monitoring, uh, especially in the southern part of, the net of, of uh, Belgium, uh, where there are more outbreaks of B cell, there's no surveillance going on. So it's a bit tricky to, to say what is the actual, the, the, the current situation of B cell in Belgium. Um, and then there's uh, B cell in Spain, and this is another uh, nice example of how pathogens can spill over from, from your domestic host to your wild host, because here there was someone who thought he could help biodiversity by releasing some pet animals into the, into the wild, and hereby uh, threatening uh, Carlo Triton and all the and other uh, native uh, Spanish uh, um, uh, amphibians. Um, so they had to do this massive uh, eradication action to try to get rid of these cells. So again, do not release any animals in the field. Um, so then the tricky thing is, of course, as was proven actually by the by the mortality event in the zoo that we had, that it's really difficult to know that you have a problem. So you need someone to tell you that you have the problem. And that is why early warning systems exist. And you have your garden wildlife health um, system, which is really good. Because um, if you're looking for dead swans, they're quite obvious to see. But if you're looking for mass mortalities of amphibians, uh, that's that's more difficult to see. And there's absolutely no point of going out on a sunny day and see if you can find any dead animals or no and dead, dead amphibians. So we are really dependent on all the accidental reports of people that they, um, when they are in the field and they see something that is not normal. Um, so an early warning system is definitely uh, essential for, for proper disease management. Uh, you may all have heard, um, probably, you, I, I think you all have heard about the disease triangle. So um, that a pathogen cannot cause disease if there is no host that is susceptible or if the environment isn't suitable for the pathogen to actually reach your host or uh, it should have the right temperature. And if there's no pathogen, there's no disease. So you need all these three ingredients for a disease to occur. So for a successful early warning system, uh, you need the eyes in the field. So you need the public, you need everybody with a, with a, um, a garden pond. You need the standardized monitoring because otherwise you don't know if you're actually seeing less animals than the previous year or if it's just um, an accidental or is it just your memory that's failing you. And you also need the scientists uh, that can help you uh, detecting or, or studying the, 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 your, 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 uh, your report uh, if there really is something going wrong. So you need your surveillance, you need your scientists, you need society, you need all those eyes and ears in the field for proper disease management to have. So maintaining early warning systems is definitely crucial. Um, and of course, this will lead to an inbox full of dirty pictures, but then, hey, that's Joe's problem. Um, but you can never report enough animals. And um, this will lead to these nice um, colorful maps 
with uh, lots of findings of animals. Uh, and it doesn't only lead to interesting findings about novel bee cell uh, discoveries, such as here, because one of these colored dots is a novel bee cell uh, site. So you need all these other dots to discover actually the one that you were looking for. But you also get nice um, uh, reports about herpes virus infections, about bloating in, in animals and all the other uh, kind of things that animals can suffer from. So it's, it's a win-win situation, I think. So we talked about observing and about reporting. And the last thing I'd like to address is uh, how important it is to uh, disinfect your materials um, and how important it is to wear gloves when you are in the field and handling amphibians. Uh, there was this, a study published last week uh, from the people from Ghent University. And they um, took two animals. Uh, they took the alitis, so the um, common midwife of the, yeah, the midwife toad and the alpine newt. And they um, infected them with BC, B cell and BD. And then they handled them with uh, bare hands and with hands with wearing gloves. And then with these bare hands and these gloved hands, they handled naive uh, uh, toads and newts. And then they found that wearing gloves protects uh, animals from getting these cell. So when you're handling a neurons, it's not so important for BD, of course. They only, they only studied BD, so they, they ignored ranavirus and all the other pathogens, uh, but for B and the B cell. Uh, but this is especially relevant for B cell. So please wear gloves when you're handling newts uh, in the field. Uh, but do not wear gloves when you're handling tadpoles in the field because they are um, they could die from the, uh, the nitrates on the on the gloves um, so i hope i have given you a um, a brief summary of the of b cell in mainland europe and uh, i can't just repeat it enough i think just please make sure that you do not transfer any pathogens because um, you may never get rid of B cell and it's really, really difficult to detect. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Enrica. Um, it, that infographic you have in there it really shows how easily it spreads around. It's quite shocking, um, but thank you very much. And uh, coming up next, we have Stefano Canessa. Um, and then after that, we're going to have our Q&A. So any questions, please pop them in the Q&A chat box. So over to you, Stefano. Thank you. You should hear me and see my screen. Excellent. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. I think I'll I more or less pick up um, where Anna Marika left. Um, and I'm going to look at a more management angle, if you want. So I started a similar version of this talk a year and a half ago by saying how good we are in detecting and stopping human disease outbreaks. And for example, when a novel coronavirus emerges, it emerges in East Asia in 2002, we can track it and stop it relatively quickly. How things change uh, a year and a half later uh, is a different different picture we've seen on the news. But I still think uh, we've got lots of, uh, lots of practice, lots of experience, lots of research, lots of knowledge in tracking and managing outbreaks of diseases in humans and domestic animals and even some wild animals. So can we do this for B cell? So I'm going to focus on this outbreak. You, your prevention has failed and you find uh, B cell somewhere in the UK. What are we doing? Well, there's one case that I'm aware of where B cell has been managed and it's been mentioned in both previous talks. Um, so in March 2018, um, B cell was detected at a site in northeastern Spain. And because it was very close to a population of a highly endangered endemic newt, um, authorities decided to implement management, very drastic management. And so they basically drained the whole site. So you can see the uh, pictures at the bottom uh, before and after. Um, drained it, fenced it, covered it, put traps and started monitoring and killing 
any amphibian, not just susceptible ones, but also ones that could potentially be um, vectors or um, reservoir hosts for B cell. A mm. couple of years later, as far as I know, the outbreak has been contained, meaning B cell has not been detected elsewhere in the vicinity, but it hasn't been eradicated. So infected animals are still being caught. So if we had to learn from this, well, there were some things that um, made at least relative success possible, and some, as Anamarik mentioned, were in that disease triangle. Um, it, it's a relatively dry area. Uh, so there's lots of dry ground between this pond and next suitable pond. Um, the outbreak probably happened just before summer. So it's a few very dry months where salamanders can't really disperse very far. Um, detection probably happened early. So that was good. Mm, although, as you can see, uh, between detection and action, there was still months. So <laughs> that window, um, well, stayed open for longer than we would have hoped for, but that's okay. It was a big effort. And also I think some management related aspects helped. Um, the decision chains were fairly short, meaning there were few links between a um, few steps between the people who found it and the people up at the ministry who actually signed off on the management. So these things were good. Other things are problematic, but not with this outbreak, just with this outbreak, but in general with this cycle of urgent responses to things that um, doing things that we haven't really done before. So acting in haste um, under the urgency of an occurring outbreak favors sometimes short short-term and possibly even short-sighted decisions. Um, as Anna Marika said, eradication is really hard. So if you don't hit hard or early enough, it's hard to actually get rid of this thing. And so it's still there, meaning that uh, spillover is still possible, dispersal is still possible, and also the source uh, is likely still present and active in releasing pets. So, and still, I my understanding is that still not no practical plan on what to do if it spreads further, if we should repeat the same thing or we, what we would do if we found it at a more, you know, populations of more, let's just say, valuable animals in a loose sense. So these were pretty drastic actions, okay? We destroyed the site completely. We killed, lot. I say we as in, I, I wasn't involved in killing anything or destroying anything. I just, uh, I just talked about this stuff. Um, so a site was destroyed, lots of animals were killed, chemicals were sprayed or dumped into the environment and a site was fenced completely. So these are possibilities that you might uh, apply if you, possible actions that you might apply if you found this cell in the UK somewhere. And typically I think what we do is we turn to science. This is also what happened back then. Um, like the managers there turned to the scientists and asked what, what should we do? Science can help you to some extent, but in the rest of this talk, I'll try to explain why science can only help and it's really a management problem. So to be prepared, we have to be prepared, prepared in terms of management. So what can we do? What can we do for B cell? What do we do for other diseases? Um, can we ever do for B cells something like uh, what we do for human diseases? Can we? isolate and treat individual patients. Um, seems like a massive task for salamanders, but we do it for some endangered species. It's been done, especially for those with very small populations, maybe those that we consider valuable for some reason. Uh, there have been cases of disease outbreaks being managed very intensively uh, with individual contact tracing and individual isolation, treatment and recovery. In many other cases, we treat wildlife diseases as we treat livestock diseases. So we just, we basically have very little concern for the individual animal. We care about preventing spread and possibly minimizing cost, either damage or the cost that we incur in doing the, um, the management. Again, this has been done. It's happened recently for reindeer in Norway. It was certainly the case for the Spanish beast cell outbreak. 
And I've put a badger here, not because I think culling badger is a good idea in any way, but just to show that these are controversial things and you can do bad things while you try to do good things, or you can just deliberately do bad things to animals while you try to do good things to other things like your, your wallet. Um, so all these things, are stuff that we care about okay we want something we manage we think we need to manage this peace out outbreak because we want something think about the spanish outbreak a site was destroyed so presumably lots of other species were impacted so where the frogs or the newts in the other valley more valuable than the, you know the plants that we destroyed or the water bird you know um, the waterfowl that we deprived of their uh, breeding pond what about the frogs that we killed the frogs that we killed, even though it was fairly obvious they would never be affected by the cell in any way. Um, maybe it was for the greater good, but it was still hundreds, possibly thousands of animals that have been killed. Dumping chemicals, um, you think about that. And also restricting access to a site, um, especially if it's a public site. In this case, it was public, pro private land, but it's also possibly a controversial thing. So... If you don't think about these values, these valuable things that you might want to improve or you might accept to lose, it's hard to plan an eradication or control strategy. And this is what we found a couple of years ago. Uh, oh, sorry, that was last year when we, do, we did a simulation study with Anna Marie and others where we put together 20 scientists and simulated, ran something like a fire drill. And we said, okay, you've, you're here. And by the end of the day, we have a B-cell outbreak. This was a real, that real Dutch case, but we use it as a simulation study. At the end of the day, you have to give us a recommendation on what to do. These are very good scientists. They still are. Uh, and they spent the day thinking about very smart ideas. And they gave us lots of good suggestions. But after a while that we were discussing, we realized their advice differ widely, they, not because they disagreed on things, but because we, we had not been clear, we were not clear ourselves on what we wanted to get out of the mitigation. The objectives of this mitigation, of this rapid response were not clear. And some people, you know, some people assumed that we were talking just about the local, very local scale, we were just trying to save the population. Some other people assumed we wanted to stop the spread at the regional or even national level. Some people assumed we had to save animals, just prevent any death. Other, other things thought um, we had very strict budget constraints. And so everybody made up their own little objectives, which meant in the end, their advice was, it was impossible to compare it. We had a wide list of recommendations, very different, but when you have to make a decision with the clock ticking, that's not gonna help. So if you don't get your management object objectives right, you can't make a meaningful decision. And getting those objectives right is the task of management, not science. And just to drive this home, and um, this is not amphibian, you will have guessed, it's a Mauritius parakeet. It was at some stage, I think the most endangered parrot in the world, but through some very intensive management, it's been well, maybe you can say rescued. It's been downlisted from critically to endangered and then to vulnerable, and it's recovering. A few years ago, um, a disease called beacon feather disease started hitting the populations in Mauritius and especially chicks in the nest. Um, and so to try to mitigate the effects of the disease, it's a viral disease, um, the idea was to develop a protocol for disinfection and biosecurity and disinfection of nests. And Debbie Fugel, who did her PhD on this topic, did a very, very interesting study, I think, where she looked at what happened with the disinfection of nests and the biosecurity. Um, she looked at the prevalence of the virus in nests. So the proportion of chicks, nestlings that were affected, they were infected. And she saw that when you disinfect the nest and use very strict, heavy biosecurity, that prevalence goes down. So if management asks a question like, can we drive prevalence down by disinfecting nests, then science will give you an answer. And that answer is yes. 
But is that the right question? When Debbie asked a different question, which was more related to the conservation of the population, I think, she asked, does the proportion of chicks that survive the nest phase and fledge improve with this infection? Because that's, in the end, that's what we care about, how well the population does. And science here gives a different answer. And the answer is no. Actually, under many circumstances, you can see that cleaning the nests reduces that survival. Mm, the reason still has to be worked out. Maybe it's stress, uh, maybe it's the, the treatment itself, but for some reason, we are not achieving that objective of improving the, um, the recovery of the population. Okay, so if we ask the wrong management question, we are gonna make the wrong decision, even if the scientific answer is right. So again, it's something that management has to do, not science. Science can do other cool things. Uh, and here, this is a study that we just finished. I think in 2020, everybody's familiar with the sort of epidemic uh, figure way like this. Um, this is a study we just finished and I'm going to simplify it to an, to an extent that will drive at least one of my co-authors mad. But this is an outbreak. This is what happens during an outbreak. You start and pretty much all of your population is nice and healthy and you have maybe one infected individual at the bottom. Uh, let me use a laser pointer, okay? So as the infection spreads, so more animals become infected, that proportion of healthy ones declines. And if this is a, a susceptible population, they will die. So in the end, your population will stabilize around that 1%, which is what we see in the Netherlands, for example, okay? So science can tell you the shape of this curve, and it will tell you, for example, that the majority of deaths will occur quickly during this phase of the epidemic, okay? Where your population drops from about 90% to around 20% of those Mm, healthy animals. That's where the mass, the majority of deaths occurs. Science could tell you, for example, that depending on where you are, uh, it, may, it might make sense to manage or not. For example, if you are down here, there's so few animals that spending a lot of money and trying to change the outcome of this outbreak, it's probably not worth it. Mm? Again, I'm simplifying a lot, but the question here, is it worth trying to do something? And science can tell you, maybe, maybe not. Science can also tell you, for example, that if you want to do something, it's best to act in this phase where you still have very few animals. And therefore, what Joe and what Anne-Marie said, early detection is really important. So science can tell you how long that window is gonna stay open for, but it's up to management then to get through. So within this time, you have to detect the outbreak. You have to ask science how advanced is it? You know, how many, how, what point of the curve are we at? But then you have to consult people. You have to ask the relevant people if they're okay with destroying a site, with killing animals, with spraying chemicals. Um, then someone has to decide what to do or not to do. It. And then you have to work out how to do it. You need to get permits probably to get to kill animals or to remove them, to dump stuff, uh, to build fences. Then you have to allocate the resources, either find the people who can do this, contract new people or um, reallocate tasks within the agency that's dealing with this. And then you actually have to do stuff. And that also takes a while. And the clock is ticking, okay? So again, science can show us this plot and tell us all sorts of nice things, insightful things, but then it's up to us to do it. And if you don't have this process more or less worked out in your head before it happens, maybe when it happens, it's too late. Again, uh, to drive this further, science can give you ideas to do stuff, then it's management that has to do stuff. Um, and there is a gap in between often. So this is another study that we did with Anamarika where we read hundreds of papers uh, that claim to have implications for chytrid management, not just B-cell, also BD. And we selected just the ones that claimed explicitly to have implications for conservation and disease mitigations. Okay, this is what you see here. 
There's lots of papers. When you actually read them, and we read them all, you find the majority of them don't actually tell you anything practical. Only a very small proportion, so this blue and red at the bottom, go as far as saying, if you do this, we expect that survival of your frogs or salamanders will improve by 5%. The majority are very good studies. Um, they can be ecology, they can be microbiology, um, genetics, anything, very good science. I, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not discussing that, but then there's a paragraph or a couple of sentences at the end that say, oh, and these findings have implications for management, which they do. But then imagine you're a manager, you find yourself in your protected area now, and you have to read 100 microbiology papers and try to work out what that means, what you have to do by tomorrow morning or maybe next week. Okay, it takes a long time to read these papers anyway. Um, so it's not the fault of the people who write those papers, they, they're doing science, and it's not the fault of the manager for not being able to turn all that into action, but there is a gap here. And this gap is big, it requires time and money. And if you think, for example, how much it costs, how much money it takes, you know, uh, how much time it takes to develop vaccines, we're talking about millions or billions um, and years, Maybe it's easier, maybe we're not trying to get a B-cell vaccine, but we're still we're trying to just get something that's good enough, some man course management that's good enough to, to, um, to do. But the point is, between the science and the implementation, there is a gap. And if, for example, for human diseases that are large, there's industry, there's pharmaceutical companies, there's engineering, and there's governments who uh tell people they should get vaccines and for um and finance and fund pharmaceutical companies for developing them and then the pharmaceutical companies invest money because they know they will have a return on investment if i think about b-cell i'm just not sure that is there i i'm i don't know if this industry um is there maybe it's volunteers and that's fine but um it's a big task. So I don't really know what the message is here, but it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. It's, it's difficult. And, and I think it's, maybe it's unfair to expect scientists on one, on one hand and volunteers on, at the other hand and to fill this big gap. Let me try to summarize. Um, so I, I highlighted some problems, I think, that um, exist in trying to manage um, B-cell outbreaks. Some maybe can be fixed, some are more structural, but in terms of taking action, I think a major problem is that in many cases I've seen, no one knows who has to make decisions. So if you found the outbreak, if you found the pathogen tomorrow, who do you call, who do you ask? Um, who has to make a decision, who has to consult people, who has to put the money in. And trying to work out this before um, the outbreak actually happens, I think would be very useful, uh, a very big component of that being prepared. Uh, and working out what the objectives are, you know, what's important to you? Is this species more important than that other species? Is uh, local destruction worth, um, sorry, is national level protection worth some local destruction, for example. And, and again, being prepared in this sense allows you to avoid those short-sighted decisions, those proxy objectives like prevalence, again, prevalence of the disease against actual persistence of species that could uh, lead you to make wrong decisions. It's good to be creative, it's good to be optimistic if you want, and to think about very bold actions that we could take. It's also good to be realistic when you have outbreaks, you have to act pretty quickly. With B-cell probably we're talking maybe weeks, maybe if you're lucky months, like the Spanish example, uh, not years. And we're not talking about billions of dollars, of course. And in general, I think some communication between the science of B-cell and the management of B-cell 
could um, could improve um, our chances of managing outbreaks. We need, you need both. You need both science and management because really there is not enough science. There is no science that will fill a management vacuum. So this, I think, is the most important message that I wanted to give today. So just to write this, uh, to summarize this in a nicer way, I think to manage B cell outbreaks for that early response, we need luck, but being prepared helps. We need science. I'm not gonna suggest for a second that we need less science. We need more science, but definitely we need more management. We need more presence of management, more involvement and more active management, more people who call the shots. And we need to think about things carefully, but then management outbreaks also needs quick decisions. And it's good if those are rational and carefully thought through. So preparedness is necessary. And I still think we can be hopeful. I mean, even the Spanish example shows that if you do good things, you could get good things. And if you can improve on good, good, those good things you do, you can get even better outcomes. We just need to be realistic on what we can do, what we probably can't do, and what we need to prepare for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefana. That's a really interesting take I haven't seen before on, our, on B cell infections and spread. It really highlights how important it is for us, especially in the UK, to be aware of the preventative measures we can take because, as you've just explained, the management is can be very difficult and has a lot in it. Uh, and we need to be really super into our disinfection. And prevention definitely seems to be a little bit easier uh, than cure because uh, it's very difficult to be managing it all. So, thank you, everyone. Uh, we've had some questions come in for our Q&A. Um, if everybody's happy, I'm going to go start picking through those and pulling them out. A lot of them look like they can be to everyone. Um, so I'm going to just pose it to all our panellists as we go through. Um, so first one I have a look at here is, would it be useful for the ARB UK um, volunteer groups to be swabbing newts for B-cell during their surveys, as well as professional ecologists? Yeah, I, I can take that one. So yeah, definitely. It's something we talked about with a few different R groups. One of, the, one of them was in the black country. I can't remember where the other one was, maybe Devon, something like that. Um, and it was, uh, it was something we talked about, but the difficulty with it is, is where the funding comes from, basically. So Garden Wildlife Health, we have a small amount of funding for uh, active disease surveillance, but not a huge amount. Um, and it obviously costs money to run these tests. So that was something um, which is a little bit of a difficulty, but isn't insurmountable. It's something where you can work ways around it to get things a little bit cheaper, um, you know, and not be maybe as thorough as you'd love to be, but, you know, because cost is an issue. Um, but no, definitely something definitely worth getting in touch and, and talking about because, you know, with those BD swabs in 2008, 2011, I think that shows that our groups can be massively useful um, in these kind of situations. So short answer, yes, um, get in touch and we can discuss it. Fantastic. So that was, uh, sorry, I didn't say that was Pete West's question. So Pete, I hope that's oh, okay. that cool. um, From Sally Gillard, is it time that the pet trade was held to account? How can we stop people from releasing their exotic pets into the wild? Pose that to everyone. <laughs> Uh, well, I can start, and I'm probably sure someone will uh, will uh, add something to it. Um, but I think it's it's also very important to stress that there are very many um, keepers of amphibians that do the right thing, and that they are very much aware of their role, and um, uh, that do have the biosecurity in place, that do not have outdoor enclosures. So um, I think we shouldn't just point at all the you shouldn't group them as one uh, bad family uh, releasing animals all over the place. But um, I know it is illegal to do so. Um, but I recently got a phone call from someone who's, who asked me where he could get crested newts because he wanted to uh, breed them in his pond and spread them around the province because they were doing so poorly. <laughs> and I told him that it wasn't allowed and he was... Uh, it was a, uh, a threat to, to with, with regard to disease, etc. Um, 
but it just ignored it. Um, so I think they're not, yeah, those kind of people, it's very hard to reach them and to actually um, make sure that they change their behavior. Um, I could I could add something in thinking about the Spanish outbreak. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't keep animals and my position is pretty um, negative on that. But I think, especially when you have those few road ones, I think what we saw is that antagonizing them doesn't bring anything good. So in this case, this person was suspected. But, you know, this is not like the movies where you just run into, you know, break into someone's house where, you know, they had to go to the judge and you, the judge has to issue a warranty if you want to search their house and they didn't. And in the end, what we had was Brita was really pissed off and would never, never now let someone into their house and possibly even, I don't know, someone could even do worse and actually get rid of all their animals at once. So even when you have the bad ones, um, perhaps it's more useful to approach them through the, breed, the, the captive breeding community rather than trying to, uh, you know, have them arrested or their house searched, which is probably not going to happen. I don't know about the UK laws, but no one considers this to be bad enough that um, to warrant, you know, arrests and uh, long, long penalties in jail. I think it's more, it's more useful to get, you know, to get to them through the community. You know, because as Anna Marika said, there's lots of responsible breeders and they can, I think, uh, exert more positive pressure than just um, turn these people into a public enemy, which they are. But... Agreed. Joe, any comments on, on that one particular? Uh, no, I just echo what Stefano and Anna Marika said. I think it's it's a very small minority of my experience of working in practice in exotic practices in the UK. I think it's the vast, vast majority of amphibian keepers are great and they read up on this stuff and they know what they're meant to be doing. It's just a very small minority and it's how you get through to that small minority, which is the really tricky bit. And I think it's our job and it's everyone who's listening now. It's your job as well as advocates for native, you know, wild amphibians to say to these people, if you come across them, you know, not in an aggressive, horrible, oh, you're terrible kind of way, but in a way, just try and engage them and get them thinking about this as, as a problem, because it is a problem. Um, but as I say, I think it's not everyone. Don't tar them all with the same brush, I would say. There's an uh, in interesting question we've got here, which reminds me of um, the paper in Peril from Perfect Pathogen, nice infographic with duck feet. Uh, Ray McGlone has asked, could herons be a vector for these diseases, eating an infecting frog, infected frog, then the pathogen passing through the gut to be deposited in the next pond? I'll put that to everyone. I thought that would be more Joe's question. <laughs> but I know, um, I, I think, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that they had proven this with runner virus, that, um, uh, that it could survive the digestion track, track of, a, of a heron. Uh, so therefore it could just reinfect uh, another site. And I also know that BD can attach to the, to the keratin of the, of the feet of ducks. Um, but then, um, and, and B cell has this insisted zoo spore as well, so it could survive uh, uh, dry circumstances much better than BD. So um, I guess that there would also be a pathway for B cell to spread um, via the, 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 but it hasn't, as far as I know, that hasn't been studied yet. Um, but then when you think about the, the habitat of the fire settlement, of course, it's totally different for crested newts or smooth newts, etc. But those fire settlements, they live in the forest and it's not really like heron or duck habitat. So I think they are not the main factors for distributing base cell, as you see it happening in, in the fire settlement populations in Germany. Joe, did you want to add? 
Anything? Yeah, sorry, Anna Marika, maybe I should have taken that one. But, um, so, yeah, I, I think we don't know, basically. I was trying to wrap my brains. I remember definitely reading a paper, I think it's BD, isn't it, where it gets where they detected it on the feet of water birds. I think that was BD. So no reason B cell couldn't do the same thing in theory. Um, and in terms of being ingested and then going through and being um, basically pooed out by birds, I don't know. I don't think I don't think anyone specifically looked at that. Um, but in theory, maybe. Okay, we've got a bit of a long question, so I'm going to say it, um, and then you can always ask me again if you want me to repeat it. But Becky Turner asks, uh, could you ask Anne Marika if she thinks that reasons um, for the lack of spread of B cell transmission between the close, between the ponds in close proximity? So could it be due to connectivity? Does she think that the newts are travelling between ponds, but for some reason B cells not transmitted between individuals? And then she asks, maybe human activity prevents the newt migration beyond the confines of their own ponds. Just asking, yeah, your thoughts on how that wasn't moving around. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, but um, so there are two things. I don't think it's connectivity in this case because the, the entire area is open. And in my eyes, it just looks all the same. Uh, but as I showed the disease triangle, you need both the pathogen, the host, and the environment. So maybe there is something in the other ponds that is not conducive to B cell, something we, we don't know yet, uh, but this is just theoretical. Um, so all those ponds are so close to each other that animals could easily migrate between them. And if it's not uh, newts doing that, it could also be uh, uh, toads or frogs, and apparently they can carry B cell as well. So. I don't know. It's it's quite um, it's quite intriguing to find out uh, what's happening over here. I must admit, though, that um, although we sampled those ponds, what we see in these outbreak sites with newts is that we detect B cell only at the early stage of the breeding season, so only in those first months, and after that we don't detect it anymore. So it could also be uh, that we just were too late or that we sampled at the wrong time. Because um, there's also has been a, a garden pond in the Bendables area where the, 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 the outbreak site that we sampled every two weeks. And then all of a sudden it just stops. So we were pretty sure yeah, it was there last week and now it isn't. Um, so it's very short time frame that you can, or that at least we detect B cell in, uh, in ponds. So it could also be a detection uh, problem. Uh, I've just got time, I think, for a few more questions. Um, one that just popped up back into the bottom of the screen. Can disease be detected in sites using something like eDNA testing? Yep, we uh, published a paper about that a couple of months ago, so it is possible, yes. But then again, it's really difficult. So you need to have the time frame correct, because you can sample with eDNA in August, but that may not be... Um, yeah, and then you you have a, a negative result, uh, but I won't say anything. So um, timing is essential. Oh, and I should add, um, eDNA, for anyone in the audience can actually explain, environmental DNA. So things like amphibian skin stuff that come off when they're in the water can be detected that way. Um, another question coming up. Is there information on whether there is uh, more than one strain of B cell? I think I'll direct that to Joe. Thanks, Alice. Um, I don't honestly know. I feel like I would have directed this to, to anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, because in terms of management and advice to the public, it's all going to be the same. Um, but Stefano, Anna Marika, I don't know if you know if there's any strains have been identified. Yeah, there are multiple strains of B cell. I don't know exactly how many, but a couple. Yep. Okay. It is in the Stegen et al. paper from 2017, if you want to look it up in the appendix. I know exactly where to find it, but <laughs> I don't have it in my head. Sorry, Joe, put you on the spot there. Um, there's one I was just looking at from earlier, um, which I presume would be best for Stefano. Do you have any links or articles relating to the outbreak of B-cell in Catalonia? So is there anywhere in specifically that people can look to see that? 
Yeah, I'm, I wrote the link in the presentation. I don't know if you caught it, but it's, um, it's a paper in conservation letters came out this year and it's open access. And I'll write the title here in the chat. So you have it. Perfect. I've just seen a question pop up from Peter Gillett. Much of the conversation related to workers and volunteers in the herb field. Uh, but I see so many dogs in ponds across many of the places I visit. And I see dogs playing in pond after pond, then going home and not getting washed, uh, but just drip drying. Uh, some of the messages may not be getting to typical dog walkers. So he says, are we wasting effort on something that's more likely going to ever be in the spread in that way? So I guess we could also say, yeah, what efforts can we put towards reaching the general public as well? Yeah, so I think I think that's a really good question. And it's it's one of those things that amphibian people and dog people seem to be warring factions most of the time with dogs trashing amphibian ponds and and um, and angering everyone who's you know trying to watch a natterjack there while this dog's rampaging around the edge of the pond. And I think that is probably, yeah, absolutely. It's it's I can see the frustration if you're visiting amphibian sites, disinfecting your equipment, being really careful, and then a dog hurtles in and runs off and goes straight home and then goes into another pond the next day. Possibly. I mean, I don't think I don't know if Stefano or Anna Marie can have any papers which have specifically looked at this as a um, as a sort of mode of, of, of transport of BD or B cell or ranaviruses. But I don't know if anyone's looked at it specifically. Uh, but yeah, in theory, in theory, yes, I suppose that could be a, a way of it getting around. I don't I don't know. I know people often mention it as a possible pathway. Um, but I'm not sure if the the body temperature of a dog or a swine or whatever or a deer would be too high to uh, persist B cell or ranavirus, for instance. So um, that's another thing to to think because there are uh, endothermic animals, of course. So it would just kill off the the pathogen on the on the skin of the animal. Okay, super. So we've got a few minutes left. I'm just going to quickly read out, I think, one more and one comment before uh, handing back to Angie. So Andrew Cunningham says, DEFRA has been developing a beta contingency plan for the past five years, but it's not yet ready for consultation. So fingers crossed, that'll be out for us soon. And Alexia Fish asks, why does timing matter for detecting B cell? Does the load decrease? Do animals get better than the reinfected ones? And is there any idea what the mechanism might be behind it? And again, this is to, to everyone. Okay. Um, so if by timing, um, you refer to when, for example, I, but I, I think also an American Joy said, it's important to detect infection soon. Uh, it's just because it's really bad and you can rip through a population pretty quickly. Um, if you if you want to do something, I mean, if you want to do something like isolating a site, stopping people to come in from coming in and getting out, spreading the disease, um, and all the way down to the more aggressive and invasive actions like draining the place. In general, if you want to, if you want to either save that population or minimize the chances of infected animals going out, it's better if you do it early. That's just the basic. Um, principle of epidemiology. I think <laughs> that's what um, we, we see in the news um, every day, right? The more you delay, the more, uh, the, the worse the outcome is going to be. Unless you detect it at a stage that is so late that you might as well just wait until it passes and then you could do something. And also, if you don't do anything, then it doesn't matter. It matters because you want to know, but then if you have no, if you take no action, it doesn't matter what, when, when you find it. Uh, it can be early, it can be late. It's just, they will, you will never know. But other than that, for mitigation purposes, if there is no mitigation, then timing doesn't matter. Um, I'm not gonna ask this one last one as a question. I'm just gonna read it out so we can all have a little nose. Uh, someone said, perhaps a project might be interesting to investigate dead herons for the presence of the pathogen in their gut. Um, because they heard of there was an outbreak around a virus after the first visit of a heron to a garden pond. I think that's a great idea. I work on skin microbiomes. My supervisor works on gut microbiomes. 
and things like geese and you can actually detect what's going on in their fecal matter so yeah that i may propose that somewhere as an idea that'd be a fascinating study to see if amphibian disease can be detected in uh, water birds fecal matter um, thank you everyone for your questions thank you to our panel for answering our questions threw them all out there um, thank you to angie for inviting me as chair and i will pass back to angie now for the summing up of the talk so thank you to Alice for chairing so well, uh, to Joe, to Anna Marika and to Stefano for sharing absolutely fascinating insights. And it's fabulous to get people together from different institutions across Europe to, to share ideas, because I think I say this every time, but we all get stuck in our bubble and uh, it's fantastic to look outside the bubble and learn from each other. Um, I just quickly want to mention, I've had a request from Jim Foster at ARC uh, we have the Hurt Workers meeting on the first weekend of February next year. It's going to be very much like this, an online Zoom meeting. And we are still looking for uh, ideas for presentations. So if you have a presentation you want to give or a workshop or an idea for a topic or theme, then um, submit that to ARC. I think they've got a Hurt Workers meeting page open and um, all... all uh, all offerings will be gratefully received. So other than that, I'm going to say thank you very much to everybody for tonight. Thank you all for um, participating, for asking questions, for just being with us. It's a fantastic thing that we can have these meetings and cross boundaries and discuss really important issues such as amphibian diseases. So we'll see you all in two weeks, hopefully. And for now, we'll say good night.